Okay, I just want to make sure that respect everybody's time. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining our WPTSO meeting tonight. We are very lucky to have Beth and Tim Manners from the Manners Group here to present the 10 things you must know about getting into college. Before we begin, um, I have Principal Rinaldi on and he would just like to say hello to everyone and say a few words. So thank, thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, everybody. I, I've been sitting here waiting to, to begin and uh, in like starting just around close to seven o'clock, people are popping on like crazy. So I think there are like 42 folks on the call right now, which is wonderful because you are definitely in for a very informative evening with Mr. and Mrs. Manners, who are, we are very grateful are back with us. I've been a uh, principal now, this is my fifth year at West Hill and I was assistant principal at Stanford High for two years, years ago. So I've been a part of, um, I witnessed different presentations about how to get into college and so forth. And by far, Mr. and Mrs. Manners are the most informative uh, folks that I've ever heard. So I think you're going to be uh, really tuning in. And although I've listened, now that I have a son at West Hill who's a ninth grade, I know that I'm going to, maybe not this year, but very soon I'm going to be paying attention um, uh, as a parent too. So I'm, I, I'm hoping uh, the Manners uh, folks will stick with us for uh, for years to come. So I'm going to be uh, driving now and then I have to transition to home, but I hope uh, you all enjoy. I know you will all enjoy and, and learn a lot tonight. So thank you very much, Suzanne, for the opportunity to welcome everybody. And thank you again, Mr. and Mrs. Manners, okay? Thank you. Great. All right, awesome. Great. All right, guys, thank, thank you. you. Uh, I'm Beth Manners and Tim Manners. And thank you, Judy Clem and Suzanne Pacifico for setting this all up. And thank you to Principal Rinaldi and West Hill for hosting us. We are college admissions consultants. We work with students, high school students on finding great colleges and help them with their applications and essays so that they can go off to college. And tonight we're going to talk about the 10 things you must know about getting into college. So I say the word college and immediately, how many people do we have on now? 57 people are probably getting a little anxious. Um, it does immediately kind of um, bring those feelings about, but I wanna calm everybody down. First of all, in the United States, we have 3,000 four-year colleges. We work with all types of students and they all go off to great colleges. Your, your students will go off to a great college. Um, a little bit about my own college journey. Um, when I was in high school, I went off one summer to Cornell University. I did a pre-college class uh, in French and I fell in love with Cornell University. And I came home and it was time to apply to colleges and there was my college list and then there was Cornell. That's really all I cared about. And I applied and I was waitlisted and I never did get off the wait list. And at 17 years old, I was just absolutely devastated. But I went off to Tufts University. I did everything. I had a wonderful experience, great education. Tim, who you just met and we'll be talking about the college essay soon. Um, he was at Tufts University too, that's where we met. And we always joke with our children, good thing mom didn't get off the waiting list at Cornell or you wouldn't be here now. So it really does all work out. On technical difficulty, there we go. So uh, applying to college is a process. Uh, there's a lot to learn and I'm hoping to um, provide some knowledge. So the most important thing about applying to college is to get the right college list. And that's individual for each student. Each student has his or her own perfect fit uh, of list, not just one school, but many schools. So you wanna to put together that list. That's what I'm working on right now with my juniors is what's the right list for each student. Um, so here are some of the factors that really are, make the best list, the best uh, fit. Number one is of course, academic match. You're primarily going to school for the academics and you wanna find schools that will challenge your students, but you also wanna find schools where they, they're not over challenged where they'll have time for the very rich college life that's there. So you wanna uh, look at you know, what's going on, what level of performance did the other applicants have and kind of match that up. 
learning style. I always ask my students, not just what do you want to study in college, but how do you want to learn? Are you a participatory learner? Kids who really enjoy classroom discussion and learn from that and learning from their classmates and getting to know their teachers really well. Those, school, those students will prefer smaller classes, classes that are more similar to what's at West Hill. And um, medium to smaller colleges will have more of those smaller classes. Other kids don't like class participation and homework and all these things, and they'd be very comfortable in a big lecture. I tell the kids, you know, think about the auditorium at West Hill. That's your classroom. That in a large university is going to be those, the size of the lectures. So with a professor up on the stage talking at you for an hour. So you have to really think about, could I learn that way? Not just, you know, big school, small school. I like the football and the excitement of the big schools, but could you learn that way? Majors and minors, um, you don't have to know what you're going to major in. Many, many kids go in undecided. Many kids change their major once they get to college several times. But when you're putting together your list, you want to explore what majors and minors each college offers. Um, I was just working with a young lady and she came up with four colleges we looked at together and three out of the four did not have a communications major that she wanted. So you wanna make sure that there are two or three paths that um, would be exciting to explore when you get to college. Curriculum, some schools have um, what's called the core curriculum. It's um, a lot of different courses you need to take freshman and sophomore year. The idea is to get you to explore in all the different disciplines, social sciences, sciences, math, writing, of course. Other schools have what's called the open curriculum, where there's a lot of flexibility, especially freshman and sophomore year. Other than a freshman writing course, you can really pick more courses that um, you choose. Um, social match and community culture. Um, that's very important. We want our kids at a residential college to be happy socially and feel comfortable. That way they'll do well academically. Location, climate kind of speaks for itself. Some kids I have want, to, want the palm trees, other want to be up in the mountains skiing. So um, that's something to think about. Cost. So there's a wide variety in cost. Uh, Yukon, Yukon stores, residential, $32,000 a year. On the other hand, some of the private schools, NYU, Bucknell, can be as much as seventy-five to eighty thousand dollars a year. So huge difference. Generally, the better, the lower cost is going to be the state school or in your own state. But in general, state schools are much less expensive than privates. However, a high percentage of students on campus, whether it's state schools or privates, are not paying the full sticker price. They're getting financial aid. Um, I could do a whole talk on financial aid, but for tonight, I'll just explain that there are two types of financial aid. There's need-based financial aid where you fill out the free application for federal student aid, uh, the FAFSA, you may have heard of that. You do that, uh, the, the students do that when they apply. And generally the aid is awarded based, it's a complicated formula, but it's basically uh, family income. How much can the family afford to pay? And then you'll get aid for uh, the gap. Then there's merit-based aid. Merit-based aid, most of the time, has nothing to do with the family's income, but has to do with the student's grades and profile and uh, SAT or ACT scores. Students, if you put your student in the very top of the applicant pool, often uh, you will get scholarships. This year already, we've had kids get a significant $20,000 a year scholarships. Uh, and some schools will layer on uh, need-based aid and then layer on top of it merit-based aid. So there are ways to make college uh, affordable. I always ask my students when we're putting together this list, why are you going to college? You may not know, again, what you want to study, what you want to major in, but what do you hope to achieve? Uh, do you want to get a job when you get out? Are you preparing for grad school? What's your vision? What experiences do you want to have at college? Um, do you want to do undergraduate research? Do you want to be on a campus with people from all over the world? Study abroad, internships. So these are the types of things. And as kids start to explore colleges, see all the exciting opportunities, they want to think, what do they want those four years to be like? 
So those are some of the factors in what a student might choose in terms of fit for college. But what are the colleges looking for from the students? How do we get in? So all colleges in the United States can't get around it. Number one is the transcript, the high school transcript. And yes, GPA is extremely important, but they're not going to just reduce the student down to uh, a number. They're going to read the transcript. I always say the transcript tells your academic story and they're looking at you in your own environment at West Hill. What choices did you make? A uh, student who's applying to be an engineer ought to have high level math and science courses on the transcript. A student who's going to be a classics major ought to have Latin on the transcript. Um, so what your choices were and, and also what level courses, honors, APs, um, that's also gonna tell a lot about a student. And um, the trend. Um, Colleges like to see the trend of grades going up. It's not unusual for students to come into high school. It's a big change from middle school and maybe struggle a little, ninth grade. But by 10th grade, they want to see you're kind of getting your sea legs under you. By 11th grade, they want to see you're really soaring. So they want to see that trend going up. Um, some students even do academic work outside of um, high school. They'll do a community college course, or sometimes a pre-college course, either at a college or online. So that also factors into that academic profile. So let's talk a little bit about uh, levels of courses, honors, APs. We work with many students, all kinds of students. Some students have had zero honors, zero APs uh, by the time they graduate high school and they go off to great colleges. Why have they had zero honors, zero APs? They're not ready. Not everybody is ready, their timeline inside, to do college level work in 10th, 11th, 12th grade. That's perfectly okay. Um, other students, and you probably know some of them have taken so many. I, I met a student last year that had 11 APs by the time she graduated. I don't know how they do that. They probably never sleep by the time she graduated um, high school. Both students also great, go off to great colleges. But when we put together that list, the student with zero APs is not gonna have the same list of colleges as a student with 11 APs. So you really have to match that level with the colleges you're putting on the list. When we visit colleges um, and go to the information sessions, uh, often this question comes up. It's usually a parent who raises a hand and asks the college admissions officers themselves. Is it better to get an A in a lower level class or a B in an honors or AP class? And no matter what college we're at, whether it's the least selective, the most selective, the admissions officers always answer the same way. Well, ideally, we'd like to see an A in the AP classes. So what do you do with that? It's pretty hard to get A's in AP classes. What we tell our students is that not everybody gets A's in AP classes, first of all, and that Yes, it's important to challenge yourself. And if you love a, a subject, go ahead and challenge yourself and take the honors or AP. But do not just stuff your program with honors and APs because your friends are when you're not ready. Getting a C, D, or F, that's a real train wreck of a transcript and the colleges you know, will not be happy with that. So after the transcript, colleges look at standardized testing. What am I talking about? The ACT or the SAT. And all colleges in the United States will accept either one. Usually students will test junior year, unless there's a reason to test earlier, or sometimes recruited athletes will test earlier. And so what I advise students to do is take a practice ACT without even studying, take a practice SAT, and see which test you either naturally score better on or maybe that you like better and put all your time and some people do those test prep courses and all that energy and money behind the one test that um, is better for you. Um, you don't have to do both. Um, now we have a lot of test optional schools. Test optional has been around for probably 15, 20 years. 
um, Bates, Bowdoin, GW, a lot of good schools, U Chicago were already test optional. And then when COVID hit, um, because it was so hard to get testing sites, almost all the schools became test optional. What does that mean? It means if your test score helps you and it really shows your potential, you submit it. If it does not, if it's a low score for that particular college, you can check off the test optional box and not submit it. And obviously the rest of the pieces of your application will weigh more heavily in the uh, evaluation. What we advise students to do is test. Um, a good score will always help you. And a lot of those kids who I just talked about who got merit scholarships, it was because of their test scores. Okay, so let's talk about how you apply the application because doing all these great things is nice, but you have to report it to the colleges through the college application. So uh, the common application is an online application and you can send it to many schools the same application. Um, there are other, most of the schools that your kids will be applying to will be on Common App, but there are other applications. The California schools, the UC schools have their own, the Texas schools have their own, Georgetown has its own. There's also another application called Coalition, but most of the schools are going to be on Common App and these other applications are often a variation to Common App. So we'll talk uh, about the Common App. Um, when we, we did a little survey with admissions officers and asked them, how often do um, students tell a cohesive story throughout all of their application, all of the pieces? And as you can see, 59% um, said just sometimes, 34% said usually, 8% said almost never. So that's something we really work on with the students is to make sure they're telling their complete story in all the pieces of the application. In writing a stellar application, that's what's key. So what are the pieces of the application? We talked about the transcript, that's a piece of your application that tells what you've done, your grades, and what courses you've taken. In the Common App, there's a section for activities, all the extracurriculars, and we'll talk in detail a little bit later about the uh, worthwhile extracurriculars. But uh, the important thing on Common App is to really fully report what you've accomplished with your extracurriculars. There's an extra information section where there's more room to really detail. We have our students write paragraphs about their extracurriculars. And you know, we ask them a lot of questions to really get at what they've accomplished. For example, I had a young man and he had, um, he had a good position in a, a national youth organization. He was the membership director. So great, colleges like leadership. And he just wrote membership director of the name of the organization. I said, okay, membership director. What did you do as membership director? He said, oh, I increased membership. I said, okay. How much did you increase membership? He said, I don't know, a lot. So, okay, that's your homework. Next time we meet, come back. I want to know how many people did you sign up? He had increased membership by 60% in a national organization. If you don't tell the colleges, they don't know. So you really want to use that application. Kids who are competing and they won an award, they came in second. Second out of five is different than second out of 10. That's different than second out of 50. You need to tell those details. If you have a job, how did you get a job? No one knocked on your door and said, here's your job. You had to pound the pavement. You, what did you accomplish at that job? All of these things really paint the picture of who the student really is and the colleges are really interested in that. So that's the activity section of the essay, of the application. And then there's the main essay, the personal essay that's part of Common App. Um, Tim's gonna talk in detail, he's a specialist on essays. But what I will tell you is this is the part of the um, application process where you become a person. It's a personal essay, a story that shows who you are. Yes, colleges care about personal qualities and personal traits and who is coming to campus. And often, this is the only chance, not a lot of schools do interviews anymore, often this is the only chance that the colleges have to meet the student is in their main essay. And you want to use this well. You don't want to your transcript tells your grades. You know to, to be bragging about your grades in your main essay. Your extracurricular list and paragraphs tell what you've accomplished. That's your resume. A lot of people think 
they should just stuff the resume into the main essay. Then you're missing an opportunity to tell more about yourself. So we wanna be strategic to use all these pieces. Then those, that, those parts, the, um, the transcript, the activity lists and the main essay go to all those colleges on your common app. But then the individual colleges have their own section of common app where they ask their own questions, the supplemental essays. And the most usual is why do you wanna to come to our school? And you have to really show fit and Tim will talk in detail about how to do that. So again, you wanna tell your full story and be strategic using all of these pieces. So I just introduced the main essay. Tim is a professional writer and essay specialist, and he will tell you all about the essays. And I just wanna start by saying that it was also lucky for me that Beth never got off the waiting list at Cornell. Uh, hey everybody, it's great to be with you uh, again, uh, the West Hill PTS, so, so many thanks to Suzanne and, and Judy, and of course, uh, Mr. Rinaldi, really appreciate your having us here uh, this evening and, and uh, sharing with you our, our thoughts. So I'm here to talk about the essay, or as I like to refer to it, the fun part of the college application process. Now, I, I understand that you might not be thinking about it quite that way, at this point, you might not be thinking about it at all, but I would just suggest to you that the more fun you have with your college essay, the more fun the schools are gonna have reading it. And the more fun they have reading it, the better your chances of getting into the school. So fun can be um, profitable uh, in this case. So um, that's something definitely to, to bear in mind. Another really important point is that the essay is, you know, is a very uh, considerable portion of the consideration that colleges will give you. When we asked, our uh, college admissions officers, uh, what, was, what was most likely to uh, undermine an otherwise strong application? And by strong, we mean, you know, you have the right grades, the right board scores, extracurriculars for a particular school. Um, what, what else, what other, from the other pieces of the application, what might uh, cause harm? Um, teacher recommendations was mentioned, as you can see, extracurricular activities, um, supplemental essays, which I will talk about a little bit later, as Beth mentioned. But, uh, kind of first among equals, if you will, here is, is the main essay. So it really deserves uh, the time and attention. Uh, you don't want to leave it to the last minute. The, you do not want to be one of those who's just scrambling to meet the deadline and just throwing together an essay. It's actually not too early to start thinking about it even now. Uh, I find that you know the best essays, while many of them come together, or some of them come together rather quickly, most of them take time and it's, you gotta give it, uh, you know, the, the opportunity to sort of simmer and percolate and so forth and go through revisions and really think it through and make sure that it is as strong as it can possibly be. So what is this thing, the essay? Uh, it's not like anything you've ever written before because it's all about you, capital Y-O-U. And when I say you, I'm referring specifically to the students in the audience and not their parents. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about that later on. But as Beth alluded to, kind of the, the, um, the central focus of the essay is your personal qualities. What makes you, you? So where do you, where do you start with that? Well, it's, it's really a simple matter, I think, of, of initially just taking stock of maybe a series of adjectives that you think uh, describe you uh, well, or maybe the way someone else might describe you. It could be that you're empathetic. It could be that you're very loyal. It could be that you're perseverant. So just make a list. It doesn't have to be a long list of qualities. And it's not as though you're writing the essay to that set of qualities, but it's a good checkpoint as you're writing the essay and certainly when you're done with it to see how many of them rose to the surface. Um, and you'll be surprised how many of them do and actually even more surprised at how many uh, other qualities that you hadn't even thought of sort of bubble up to the top. That's that's part of what makes writing the essay fun and cool. At least that's what my students tell me is they learn something about themselves that they didn't know before they wrote the essay and they probably never would have uh, learned if they hadn't gone through this exercise. So the other really important thing to do is really go through and take stock of what interests you. You want to write about something that you really love, something that you would enjoy writing about, even if it seems like not a likely subject for your essay. Um, it could be something that's very likely. It could have something to do with one of your extracurricular activities or academics, but it, it could be just something that you're very passionate about. So think about your interests and, and which of those interests you would most like the colleges to know about and sort of start brainstorming ideas from there. The third point on this is, um, 
is that you wanna write about yourself today. That may sound obvious, but it kind of goes with what I was saying before about uh, the essay being a little bit of an uncomfortable uh, project just because it's something that you haven't done before and you know, you're writing about yourself. And sometimes that's a little bit self-conscious. Um, and there's a tendency because of that sometimes I've seen among some students to start writing about themselves in middle school or elementary school. Well, the colleges don't want to meet you uh, from years ago. They want to meet you now today. So make sure that the frame for your essay is from ninth grade freshman year or the summer before freshman year because you're a rising freshman through the present. Um, that is just super, super important. So that's kind of what the essay is. How do you go about doing this? Um, well, as Beth mentioned, it's a story. And like any other story, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, like just about every story ever written does, or it's really doesn't quite qualify as a story. There's sort of a narrative arc of a series of events that sort of build. There's always, always, always a conflict in there somewhere. It could be a conflict with something else or maybe with yourself. Um, but the conflict must be resolved. That's also a, a requirement of a story. Uh, you don't want to leave the reader hanging or uh, it just doesn't have the effect. You're not getting your message across. So start, you know, when you, when you think you know what you might want to write about, kind of break it down into those parts, beginning, middle, and end. And it's not necessarily that you're going to write your essay in that order, but break it down into the pieces, the parts of your story. Write a little bit about each of those. And then later on, you can think about how those pieces might fit together. It's a little bit like putting together a puzzle sometimes. So you've got that narrative arc going and you are the hero of the story, um, which can sound a little bit daunting because you probably don't think of yourself as a hero uh, unless you've you know, saved someone out of a burning building, which would probably make a great college essay. Most people haven't done that. In fact, at age 16, 17, you probably haven't done much of anything that really feels like it's that significant. And that's, that's just fine because the classical definition of a hero is just anybody who leaves a safe space, say leaves home and goes out into the world, uh, experiences things, is challenged, overcomes those challenges, learns something new and grows and changes as a result of that experience. And those are key words. I think if there's anything that colleges are looking for, it's they wanna see evidence of how you have grown and changed since you entered high school. Um, so that, you know, by that definition of hero, really anybody is a hero. So um, start to get comfortable with that, that idea. And it's a hero who's on a journey and it could be a journey of any uh, duration really. Um, some journeys are, are long. I had a student a uh, couple of seasons ago now who wrote uh, an essay, really great essay about building a drone. And it was something that he initially thought would take him uh, an afternoon. It ended up taking him six months. And so it was all about the trial and tribulations. Actually, it was kind of funny in many ways that he went through to get there. Uh, so his story played out over a, you know, a sort of an extended period of time. But we've had other essays that take place in a flash and it's just a moment, uh, an epiphany or just something that happened. Maybe it was something that someone said to you. Uh, this is an essay that was written a few years ago now. And we always seem to come back to it but just because it was so compelling. It was about a young lady who was a dancer and she was in the studio and she wasn't giving it her all. She's kind of watching the clock. Her instructor walked over to her, looked her in the eye and said, I'm disappointed in you. And that moment like that changed her. And she decided moving forward, not just with dance, but with everything, she was always going to give it her all. Really worked well. So think though about sort of the time frame of your, of your journey. Um, ultimately, it's, it's about some insight. What, what makes you you? The colleges are not necessarily looking for a great work of literature. They are not expecting that you're going to be Ernest Hemingway or even F. Scott Fitzgerald. Um, they want a well-written piece that hangs together. It's grammatically correct and well-organized and so forth. But really, all they're looking for is a window into what makes you who you are and that you're communicating that effectively and using your own voice. And you may have heard that of that concept before. It's a little bit of an abstraction or it sounds that way at first. What does it mean for your voice to come through in an essay? Well, it just means that the essay should sound like you, which is a little bit different than what you're used to. Uh, probably in the typical English class essay, you're writing in a more formal style and not necessarily as yourself, but as an, an outside analyst, sort of a dispassionate observer. But in this case, you kind of want to dispense with that. Actually, you totally want to dispense with that and write your essay in a, in a more relaxed conversational tone. 
Um, tell the story as though you were telling it to a friend. And if you do that, that's how the admissions officers are gonna hear it. It'll be that much more effective and that much more outstanding if they feel like you've relaxed and you've really let them know what makes you tick. Uh, and you're not afraid necessarily to sort of, um, you know, relax about, about that in that way. Um, going back to our survey for a moment, we asked what are the, what are the most common mistakes made in the essay? Um, poorly written is one of them. You know, when I say be relaxed in, with your language, it uh, doesn't mean that it should be an extended text message with no periods or <laughs> capitalization. Uh, you still need to follow rules, rules of grammar. Uh, you need to proof that essay, have several people take a look at it for typos. You don't want a single typo in your uh, application. Uh, if you have multiple typos, it can really leave a bad impression. Uh, boring and unoriginal. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a moment. Inconsistent with the rest of the application, that goes to much of what Beth has been saying, that the colleges, many of them, if not most of them, look at your application in total. They use this word holistically. And so it's important that your essay fit into the, that total picture. Uh, and that it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb, like that could be a real red flag if your essay seems inconsistent with the rest of what, you, what your application says. Obvious adult Interference, this is uh, my personal favorite, uh, speaking as a, a parent who has sent uh, two kids off to college. And I know how difficult that is. Uh, it's it's uh, semi-traumatic. It's, it's uh, certainly uh, an emotional thing uh, that, that, that happens. Um, but I would suggest to you in addressing the parents in the room specifically right now that this process of letting go, the essay is a really good sort of first step in that process to give your student that freedom of expression, to really say what it is that they wanna say the way that they wanna say it. Now that, that role of the adult is, uh, is a little different where I'm concerned because uh, I, I'm a coach, I'm like a baseball coach. I'll help with your hitting, I'm not gonna to go to bat for you. I'll give you the encouragement and, um, and the tips and so forth to help get you there. Um, but the number one thing, as you can see here, this big green bar is lack of focus or a message. This is so important. And you need to really start your application or your essay rather with a somewhat of an idea, a fairly clear idea of what it is that you uh, are trying to tell the colleges about yourself. I had an admissions officer say to me once that the message of your essay should fit on the front of a t-shirt, not down the sleeves and round the back, but on the front. It should be that succinct and that easy to grasp um, to the point where you know, at some point you may be, uh, your, your application may be presented in a committee and the other committee members will say, well, what was the essay about? They should be able to say in a sentence or two what your essay was about. Now that sounds like it could be a little bit daunting, um, but there's some exercises you can go through uh, that kind of help with that. One that I like is just a sort of a fill in the blank exercise uh, where you just say, you know, my essay is about uh, the value of blank. And it could be the value of being a good listener. It could be uh, the value of trying things that don't come easily to me. Uh, it doesn't have to be anything necessarily uh, fantastically original. It just needs to be clear uh, and to really uh, make the essay work harder for you. So you, you need to start with that uh, idea in mind before you even start writing. It's like, wh what is this essay about? What is it that I'm trying to say? You also should be open to the possibility that it could change along the way. Um, because I've seen that happen many times too. I have a student who starts writing with a particular message in mind and then realized through the process of writing, because writing helps you think, uh, that the message was actually something a little bit different and actually quite a bit better. Uh, so definitely be um, open to the idea that your message could change along the way. So that point about message really goes to what Beth has been saying about your application being a strategy. You can't have a strategy uh, unless, you, unless you have a message. Uh, so, you know, again, you need to really think that through uh, and, and work at that, make sure that it is, is a tight and compelling idea, ultimately at the center of your essay. It needs to be memorable. And this is kind of a difficult, this can also seem like a difficult one, because when you think about it, these college admissions officers have been reading 60 of these essays a day during their peak reading season. And they, some of them have been doing that for years. So they've seen every single topic under the sun that you could possibly imagine. And I, you know, you don't want to waste time thinking that you're going to come up with a topic that nobody has ever come up before because that's almost impossible. 
but that doesn't mean it can't be memorable. And there are also some, some uh, techniques that you can use to do that. So one of them is uh, to really narrow down the focus of your story. So say that you're, um, uh, you play football, so you want to you want to write something about being a football player. Well, you're not going to write the whole history of your three years as a football player. You want to think about maybe the top three most memorable things that happened. And maybe there's a story within there. And maybe there's even a story even, even by drilling down even more deeply uh, that's, that's even more focused than that. Uh, the, the more focused you become, the more specific you become, the more likely that you are bringing something to the essay that only you could bring to it, which is really the key to the whole thing. Another uh, idea is to combine ideas, uh, not just to write about one thing, but maybe two different things, or maybe even three, but just to, to sort of uh, look at a couple of things that you really care about and how they connect and maybe in a way that you yourself hadn't thought of before. Um, this past season, I had a wonderful essay by a young lady who was expert at Rubik's Cube. Uh, she was also a very skilled runner, uh, cross-country runner. Uh, she could have written her essay about either one of those things, but the magic happened when she put them together. And she wrote about how her uh, understanding of solving the Rubik's Cube informed her strategy as a runner. Now, um, that's probably not an essay. It's not likely that that's an essay that anyone has seen before. So, uh, you know, cast a wide net, consider different possibilities and kind of mix and match and you'll do really well. Ultimately, you want something that's that's entertaining, um, which is you know uh, stands to reason again because you've got uh, these college admissions officers who are reading so many of these and they might stop reading uh, if if you're not holding their attention. The key to that is that you don't want to give your away your story at the beginning, which is you know usually the way you write an English class essay, isn't it? Uh, you're supposed to state what the topic is and then explain that. Well, this is kind of turning that on its head, where you want to capture interest, you want to create a little bit of uh, drama perhaps or tension uh, and not really give away where you're going with it entirely uh, until the very end. So you kind of coax the reader and you engage the reader into finishing uh, the entire thing. Think of it almost as your own little 650 word movie. And by the way, that's how long the essay is. I get asked that question quite a bit. It's 650 words, which is actually very short. I think you'll find when you start to get into it, uh, I would say on average, most of the students I work with, their first draft is about twice that length. So it's more about cutting it down than building, building it up. But you, you just wanna make sure that, that, um, that you've, you've brought your best um, skills to bear. You know, the extent, I said, you didn't have to be a, a fabulous writer, but the extent you know something about how to describe a scene and how to backfill with narrative, things that maybe you've learned in English class, you can certainly uh, use them here. Uh, if you're a great writer, it's a, it's a great opportunity to showcase that. So I did want to touch uh, finally a little bit on the uh, supplemental essay, which Beth mentioned briefly as well. Uh, colleges ask their own questions in addition to the main, uh, the main essay in the, in the Common App. Uh, and there's uh, different schools ask different questions. They're varying lengths and, 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 and they just, they each, Kind of bring, try to bring forward their own personality through some of these questions. But the most common question that is asked, as Beth said, is why do you want to attend our school? Which is a very fair question. If I were admissions officer, I think that I would want to know that too. So um, they ask the question sometimes very directly, sometimes not so directly, but essentially what they're getting at is why do you want to study, what you want to study, and why here? So the first part of that is you need to think a little bit about which academic subjects, which classes you've taken in high school have been most interesting to you and why? And write a little bit about those things. Give them a sense of who you are as a student, short of you know, declaring a major, which almost nobody, uh, would, almost nobody does that. And then you want to match that to what the school has to offer, to its resources. And it's, it's a bit of work, but it is really worth it for a couple of reasons, which I'll get into in a moment. You want to go to their website. You want to go, if you're into history, you go to the history department website, you go through their course catalog and you find interesting courses. You find a professor who's doing interesting research and you mention him or her by name. Uh, you talk about the internship opportunities or that you're really excited about the study abroad because you can go to the London School of Economics 
things like that that show them that you have taken the time to really learn why the school is a good fit for you. And it's not just because it's a pretty campus that's in suburban Boston, which is, you know, a lot of people want that, but that isn't really a reason, at least in their eyes. They already know that uh, about themselves. What they want to know is how are you going to take advantage of the resources that they have available? And you want to be as specific about that as possible. So the heart of it is that academic match, depending on how much space they give you. Some schools only give you 100 words, others give you up to 800 words. You may be able to fold in some other uh, information um, about how you might become an engaged and active member of the community outside the classroom by joining various clubs, and maybe those are clubs at the college that are similar to ones that you were involved with in high school. Maybe you're going to do community service. That's always a possibility. That's something that you would want to mention as well. And then finally, uh, to the extent that you've done a campus visit, it's really a great idea to include something from the visit in the essay. So when you're visiting the campuses, be thinking about that. Um, a lot of students have said to me when they go on these tours that the colleges often look alike and what they're told sounds very much like from one school to the next. So what I advise is to listen for what's different because there's always something. It might be something that your tour guide said it might be something that you heard in the info session. Maybe you talked to a student. Maybe you were lucky enough even to catch up with a professor. But what is that thing that you heard or saw uh, beyond just a pretty campus in a nice college town with you know, state-of-the-art facilities that is a reason why you want to attend that school? It will really add a lot to your application if you take the time to do that. So that's uh, what I've got. Um, I hope that's been helpful. I'm going to turn it back to Beth and just say once again, have fun with it. It'll pay off. OK, so a few other important factors about getting into college. Um, so we've talked about you know, the grades, rigor, and scores, the great application. There's something called demonstrated interest. And what does that mean? Um, when you apply to a college, it's in the college's best interest if when they offer you admission, you, the student, you say yes, uh, you enroll. Um, why do they care? It's called the yield rate. They want a high percentage of kids who they offer admission to, to actually come to campus and enroll. Um, it helps them in the rankings. They have no idea that colleges, many students nowadays are applying to 10, 10 colleges and more, um, they have no idea if they're at the top of your list, the middle, or the bottom. So they kind of guess. And they guess by tracking, did the student demonstrate interest in our college? And some of the schools have very sophisticated software to track this. Now, not all schools are interested in demonstrated interest. It's usually the medium to smaller schools, usually the huge state schools, U, Wisconsin, couldn't care less, Penn State. But the mediums to smalls do care, and it can make a a difference. How do you demonstrate interest? There's many ways. Here's a few. Visiting campus, absolutely. Now, the days after um, COVID, there's a lot of virtual tours and info sessions. So if you can't, if the campus is too far away, it's in Texas, go on the virtual. If it's nearby, you know, the Lehigh admissions officers told our kids here, if we're two and a half hours away, if you don't visit, we don't really think you're so interested in coming to our school. So visiting campus. If schools have interviews, many of the smaller ones do, or some of them have alumni interviews, uh, I always recommend students do the interviews or we prep with them, we do a mock session, but it shows that you learned a lot about the school and you've taken that time and really making that effort. Um, when you visit the school, really learning, as Tim said, as much as you can, even if you have the opportunity to sit in classes, meet professors, write about all this in your supplementals, that's great. Emailing admissions officers. Admissions officers, those are the people who read your application. Those are the people who are the gatekeepers. They sound kind of scary, but they are not. They are friendly. They're often very young, recent alumni who have gone into admissions. They're people people. They love teenagers. They love learning all about high schoolers. They want to hear from you. So uh, we advise our students, write them an email, uh, usually the one for uh, your region, the one for Connecticut or Fairfield County, Connecticut. Um, when kids have a question about a school, I'll tell them that's a great question to ask the admissions officer. Now you have a reason to write them. My current seniors who are waiting on their regular decision, their applications are in, and um, 
we're writing to them once a month. Here's what's new. Here's what I've been up to. The supplemental essay that Tim talked about really does showing that bit, showing you dug down and really did your homework um, is a great way to demonstrate interest. The biggest way to demonstrate interest is early decision. So what is early decision? Well, first let's talk about how you apply and let's talk first about what regular decision is. So um, every school has its own deadline, uh, but most of the regular decision deadlines are somewhere in January of senior year, January 5th, January 15th, maybe in this latest February 1st. That means you've submitted your application, your essays, your letters of recommendation, your transcripts and your test scores. And schools will take January, February, March, and students will have all their replies by April 1st of senior year. And then they have the whole month of April to um, make a decision. They can go on admitted senior days, special programs that the colleges have where you go on campus and really do some more research. And May 1st, all colleges in the United States, it's signing day. And you have to pick that one college and that's where you're going to school. So that's how regular decision works. Now, some schools, not all schools have early decision. Um, again, the deadlines are for early decision are individual to the college, but most of them are around November 1st of senior year. So it's not quite, it moves up a little bit. November 1st, I've seen as early as October 15th, November 1st, November 15th. Those are usually around where the deadlines are. That means everything's been submitted and you'll find out whether you, got in uh, early also. You don't have to wait all the way to April 1st. You'll find out usually by the end of December, often before Christmas, uh, whether you were accepted at your early decision school. But you can only pick one early decision school and you're making a binding commitment to that school. You're going to sign um, a statement, a very serious statement saying, if you accept me, I will withdraw all my other applications and I will come. So why would a student do that? Well, the best reason is you have a favorite school and seniors love to be finished by the end of December um, of senior year. Um, so that's a great reason, but there are strategic reasons to do early decision. Most schools that have early decision will give the student a significant boost in the um, application process, the admission process. What does that mean? you'll get in a little bit easier, maybe a little bit less grades, rigor scores. For example, uh, American University in Washington, DC, admit rate uh, a year ago was um, about 35%. So highly competitive, one in three kids got in. In the early decision round, it was 80%, huge difference. Um, Cornell University, admit rate somewhere around overall 12%, very selective, very competitive school. In the early round, still very competitive, but somewhere around 24%, so a big difference. And many schools that have early decision will fill 30, 40, 50, 60% of the class in the early round. So that is the biggest way to demonstrate interest. Now there is one other way to apply called early action. Um, again, not every school has early action, but if they do have it, um, the deadlines are earlier, somewhere around November 1st, You'll find out earlier, not always by the end of December, we're still waiting right now for a few schools right now in January for their early action decisions, whether you got it or not, um, but still much earlier. And um, with early decision, you can apply to as many early, uh, with uh, just a few exceptions, um, as many early action schools as you want. So that's really nice to find out early. Our students this year who got into U Vermont, for example, they found out before Christmas they're accepted at U Vermont, and they don't have to get, let U Vermont know, yes, I'm enrolling, no, I'm not, until um, May 1st with all the other schools. Okay, I want to talk just a little bit about extracurriculars because we always get asked what's worthwhile, what's not. So when I went to college, um, colleges wanted the well rounded student. Now they're assembling the well rounded class, a class of specialists. So that's actually good news because that what that says to students is you don't need to for extracurriculars, join every club, try everything, do everything, spread yourself so thin and have this laundry list of activities where you never really accomplished anything. What you should do is do what you love. Authenticity is important. Don't just do things for college. Find out what you love, 
and take it to as high a level as you can. Go deep. A few things and really work at them is the best way. Uh, they call that often, you know, really layer on a lot of activities with one interest on um, building a hook. Um, be yourself and try not to look like everybody else and still, you know, be authentic. Don't do things just for college, but if you have some more unusual interest, definitely do more of that and play more of that up. We had a young man this year who uh, taught himself how to play the bassoon. Uh, not a lot of kids had that on their college applications. Um, had a young, another uh, student who was really into collecting coins and con connected coins with history. Um, I had a student who was really interested in the brain and he somehow ended up he volunteered for something. He saw a Yale study on the brain and the, he asked so many questions, he ended up with an internship. So some of these more unusual, you can still do your sports and the things that everybody else is doing. Some of those more unusual interests um, you'll enjoy and also will make you stand out. So I talked about creating that hook, really going deep with one interest. So here's a young lady who was a photographer, not so unusual, but what she did um, was really great. Uh, first of all, she was a photographer for the school paper, always good to be involved with uh, school activities. She joined photography clubs, but here's where she really was creative and out of the box. She organized, she went around town and organized with different stores and banks, her own photography shows. So um, it was really very um, good way to show off her stuff. Um, there's lots of contests for not only photographers, artists for high schoolers. So I always encourage my students to enter and she did, she entered many and eventually had some awards. Um, she interned with a prominent photographer one summer and then she had her own uh, paid photography jobs or mitzvahs, parties, things like that. And she continued to study photography by taking classes. So that's an example of going deep and building a hook in something you love. Um, so we asked uh, admissions officers, you know, what they value in terms of extracurriculars. And here you can see leadership, a big word that comes up a lot for high schoolers and from colleges. And, um, you know, again, when I talk to my students, Nice if you're president or captain of the team, but what did you do? What did you accomplish as um, captain of the team or president? Um, also, it's not always easy to become, sometimes a popularity contest. Sometimes it just doesn't happen for some students. You can still be a leader by taking initiative. That, that young lady did organizing her own photography shows. Um, Long-term commitment. So again, go deep really do what you love and do a lot of it and be consistent. So um, the more selective the school, the higher grades and rigor you need, the higher SAT and ACT scores you need, and also they're looking for a higher level of accomplishment with your extracurriculars. When you get up into the Ivies, the kids have extraordinary grades, rigor and scores, and they also have extraordinary extracurriculars. So what makes uh, extraordinary extracurricular in the eyes of an admissions officer? Uh, number one, that initiative, that you did something that, you know, you didn't just follow what everybody's done. You did something out of the box. You created your own opportunities. High level of accomplishment really takes an extracurricular up to a higher level and impact. Who did you affect? Um, by what you've done. Um, we had a young lady who started um, a soccer program, underserved kids, and she staffed it with all her friends. And that soccer program, even after she went off to college, still went on for year after year. It made an impact on so many people. So that also, I call the two eyes, initiative and impact, and then a high level of accomplishment. So we said 10 things uh, that we would tell you about getting into college. I think we taught, taught, told you a few more than 10 things. Um, so it's a lot of information. If you remember three things from tonight, number one, remember we started with that just right list. That's a fit for it's individual to the student, but that's the most important thing is to have that right list. 
Uh, number two is stand out by being unique and not doing what everybody else, create, that, create those out of the box opportunities and take them to a high level. And number three, then use all the strategic um, parts of the application to really tell them about yourself and tell them how you're unique and what you've accomplished in the application essays and in interviews. So thank you for coming. Um, if you have questions, I think Suzanne's gonna field questions and, and let us know. Um, and we'll try to answer some questions and our email is here also. You can also write to us, come on and have a talk. Yes, if any, but thank you so much, Beth and Tim. It was really informative. Um, if anyone has a question, just type it in the chat and we can hopefully get it answered. No questions so far. I can't believe that. You have a shy group here? <laughs> yeah. People are just furiously typing. <laughs> Maybe that's it. <laughs> Oh, somebody is typing, yay. <laughs> Thank you, Gina. I guess, you know what, I'll ask the question. What do you think is better? Do you think it's better to, I know you mentioned visits, but do you think it's better to wait to get accepted to a college or visit it first? Well, it's important to visit some colleges just so a student knows does she want a medium, a small, medium, or big college? Does she want to be in a city? How do you even know what's put on the list if you don't do some? So you don't have to go flying all around the country, but drive to some colleges and see them. We have right here in Connecticut, you could go as big as UConn or as small as Trinity College. So go and visit. But the big state schools are not going to care. So if you're applying to Michigan or Wisconsin, you could read about them, learn about them, and then go vis visit. The smaller and mediums, if they're within driving distance, they're going to expect that you either made a campus visit or at least did the virtual for that demonstrated interest piece. And you'll learn so much. So definitely, as much as students can, it's great to visit. Okay, great. We, now we have a couple of questions. How are colleges thinking about the impact, impact COVID has had on students? Ah, that's changing day by day. Um, it's very hard on the colleges. They, you know, in terms of the impact uh, psychological, they have a lot more counseling and things like that. They're trying as hard as they can to make everything accessible, but keep everybody safe. So it, yes, it's been a very big challenge and battle from the college point of view and, and for students too. And you know, Suzanne, you're the mom of a, a college student now. So it is, is a very big challenge. Yeah. Definitely. Um, we have another question. It is, how do you find that list of schools? There are so many. Okay. So first I like to start, and I know West Hill has Naviance. Um, I like to use Naviance to know, you know, look at your students' GPA and, and um, if they have scores yet, their scores, their test scores. And you want to find colleges that are in the wheelhouse. And then you want to think of some others, what region do you want to be in? Is the whole United States in the running or are we staying Eastern Seaboard? And then from there, you know, really look at size and start to, you know, do a few sample colleges and see how you like them and then go from there. Um, there's also um, this guide. I really like that a lot. So kids can start to read a little bit themselves about different colleges. And that's what we work on a lot with uh, students. We know the colleges really well and we make a lot of suggestions. I'm sure the guidance counselors could do that also at West Hill, but we make a lot of suggestions uh, as we get to know kids of what might be a good match. But you know, if you're absolutely lost, getting out and visiting some, looking at some virtual tours and starting to see how they are different and what is really right for you. Perfect. Uh, the next question is, do you find that the pandemic is affecting students' ability to get involved in extracurriculars? Yes. And so that March 2020, you know, everything kind of just shut down and those kids who applied, um, some of them did have some holes in their um, extracurriculars and colleges understand everybody was in the same boat. 
the real super achievers somehow found a way, you know, those kids will do that. They found stuff online. There is a lot online. Um, but now we're also finding that um, kids are out and about, they're going to school. So the extracurriculars, you know, they, there is time to do that and there are ways to do that. So um, kids are have a higher profile in terms of extracurriculars and that's who you're competing against or is everybody else. So um, they are expecting that. Okay. Uh, the next question is, hi, how does it work if you get accepted early decision, but the financial aid isn't what you can afford? Okay, so that's the one, and colleges will tell you that, the one way to ethically get out of an early decision is if you cannot afford and they did not give you the uh, aid that you need. Okay. Um, maybe could you just go over the difference uh, between early decision and early action once again? Sure, sure. So early decision is where you pick one school and the school, the school has to offer early decision, not every college does. You, pick, you still apply to all the schools, but you pick one as your early decision, your favorite, and you sign an agreement. And um, so the student will sign the agreement, one of the parents will sign, and uh, their guidance counselor at West Hill will sign this agreement that says, if accepted, the student will commit to that school. That's where they're going. So you're making a binding commitment to that school if you get in. You're still applying everywhere else in case you don't get in. And then if you do get in, you need to write to your other schools and say, I'm withdrawing. So that's early decision. Some schools have a second round, you know, so say you early decision November 1st, you find out before Christmas you didn't get in then there's some schools um, will have an ED2. Not a lot have it, I wish more did. And you can January 1st, those deadlines are in January. You can pick that ED2 and it's a second chance to get the boost and make that commitment. And you'll apply whatever the ED date is and then find out usually way before April 1st. Early action, there is no commitment. You're just applying early and finding out earlier. Does it help you the way ED does? It helps a little bit. ED gives a big boost. Uh, EA, sometimes by the regular decision round, they just have plain run out of seats. So unless you're really a standout in the pool, you're not gonna get in. So EA, I always advise kids to do EA um, with the exception of if they had a bad junior year in terms of grades, then they'll wanna do regular decision and have more time to have show more senior year grades. But most kids who've done a good job junior year, um, if they have early action, um, you do it. Perfect. Um, someone's asking if it's beneficial or a negative to take the SATs multiple times, does it matter? There's no, um, no problem with taking it multiple times. They will not disadvantage you that, gee, she's got a good score, but it took her you know, twice. Um, usually what I recommend to students is um, once in a while, maybe one in 10 of my students will hit the numbers they're looking for on the first testing. Very rare, okay? Usually kids will take it a second time. If you've prepped and you've done your homework, um, you know, you, you might really be done. Once in a while, students will say, oh, you know, I did better on my practice tests. I had a headache that second one. I know I can do better. I'm going to take it a third time. And sometimes they do better. That's really it. If you've done your homework three times, hopefully you get it done in two. Three times is really enough. I have seen students say, I'm going to keep doing it until I get the score on fourth, fifth, and sixth. Usually they're running in place. Usually, you know, that's the best score they're capable of. If they've done their homework, then we go with that score. Okay. How are, how are colleges evaluating past fail grades due to the impacts of COVID? We moved to Connecticut over summer and previous school transcript for ninth and 10th grade read as, read as such. Okay, so they're gonna look at you in your own environment. So if the high school you're at or that you came from is making everything pass fail, then that's fine because that's all you had available to you. So they really do, they know about different schools, there's explanations, make sure it's clear that uh, in the application, and you can always put a note or the guidance counselor can that uh, the student didn't choose to do everything past fail, that that was the only option. And there's plenty of cases like that because of COVID. Okay. Um, how are colleges evaluating applications from students who attend private schools versus large public schools? 
Hmm. <laughs> That's a tricky one. Uh, they know the schools very well. So they know what's offered. Sometimes private schools offer more, maybe not more APs, but more very rigorous courses. So they're gonna expect the students have taken advantage of those versus public schools. So they really are evaluating you in your own school. Okay. And they, they, they come around, they, 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 in normal times when it's not COVID, they travel to the schools all fall, they're visiting high schools. They know West Hill very well, all the colleges come uh, and they know the private schools also. So they're really looking at what did you do as a West Hill student or what did you do as a private? And you're kind of looking at with what was available to you. Okay, someone said, can you do early decision for one school and early actions for others at the same time? Yes, you can. Um, and then if you get into the ED school, you have to withdraw from those all. Yes, you can and you should. Uh, many middle ranked private liberal arts colleges are doing things to attract high achieving students or students that will help increase their geographic diversity. Oh, she didn't finish the question. Never mind. We'll get back to that. Are there any suggested number of AP classes that one should take throughout their high school experience? I think you touched on that a little. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, the admissions office will tell you the more the better, but you have to do what's right for, for, for each student. You know, do not, I don't, staying up until three in the morning because you're stressed out and you can't get your homework, that's the wrong number of APs. Uh, it's better to match the schools that you're applying to, to the number of APs. That data is out there. You can find out, you know, what are average kids taking at the school? Um, and, and do it that way. That's better and take the right program for each student without overstressing. Okay, and this is a follow-up question regarding the public school versus private high schools. Um, she said, let's see, private high school has that changed during the pandemic in that private schools have better maintained continuity of in-person education. Again, you know, the guidance counselors, the school profiles, the admissions officers find out what's going on in different schools. So I wouldn't say it, it, it is an advantage. You know, kids from private schools do very well. Um, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but they're, again, they're looking at you in your own school. Perfect. I think those are all the questions for now. Good. So if anybody wants to write to us or email or phone, if you have further questions or you want to come on in and meet us, we're in Westport where we do a lot of Zooms and um, thank you again for having us. It was great. Yeah, thank I you. Have one more question before okay. you go. Um, and this is actually a really good question for all of us. Is there a place you can get info for different scholarships available to apply? So where would we look for scholarships? Okay. Uh, you can find stuff online. I can't say there's any one site. My experience with scholarships and my students is that the best scholarships um, come from the actual universities and you apply, you pick, not your reach schools, not your target, your likely schools, where you're, if you look at Naviance, you're at the top. Those are the schools that are going to offer significant scholarships. There's lots of other scholarships out there by companies and foundations, um, there are a lot of work to apply for them and they're a very small dollar amount, you know, $1,500 a year versus maybe getting $20,000 a year from. So my experience has been, if you really want scholarships, make a smart list in terms of putting the student at the top of the applicant pool, look at Naviance, make sure their numbers are way high. They don't have to be the straight A students, my B students get, my C student, you know, you have to be at the top of the applicant pool, use the data that's available in Naviance. Put yourself at the top for many schools and you'll have some merit scholarships. Great, thank you. Um, I think that's it for now. So Beth, Tim, thank you so much for presenting so all this wonderful information for us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And I would just add that you can also visit us at our website, which is themannersgroup.com. Perfect. And this meeting is being recorded. So if you didn't write everything down, we can always reference it. Great. All right. Good luck, everybody. Take care. Good luck. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.